Then we get into Buddhist Japan. Now, in 552, legend informs us that a Korean ruler sent an image of the Buddha along with sutras to the emperor. This marked the beginning of the Asuka period. And Japan's elite begin to embrace Chinese and Korean cultures, including the embrace of Confucianism and Buddhism. But Buddhism will again change when it comes to Japan. And we get this concept of Zen Buddhism, of meditation-based Buddhism, very similar to Chan Buddhism, which we see in China and which we dealt with earlier. So by 684, a centralized government formed, bringing with it what's called the Nara period, N-A-R-A, and Buddhism will be well established within 50 years, but it will never displace Shinto. Whereas in China, Buddhism displaces a lot of the previous ideas, in Japan, Buddhism and Shinto play really well together. And the form of Buddhism, as I said, is Zen Buddhism where they're rejecting the authority of dogma and scripture. And the stress is on meditation. This is long-practiced meditation. This is hours, days, weeks, months, years of practice. Uh, teaching is passed directly. The true nature of things cannot be explained in writing. It has to be understood through oral teaching and through meditation. And... Basically, Zen is this highly practiced, highly structured form of Buddhism. And we'll get into it a little more in a couple of videos. But we also see what's called the Kamakura period. By the late 12th century, we see great civil wars ending, and it ends the rule of the imperial family and creates a military government or shogunate. The imperial family is still there, but they're just a figurehead. We also return to positive relations with China, including an appreciation of new Chinese architecture and Zen Buddhism. And we have uh, Shogun. Now, Nara, this great religious precinct, had been destroyed in the civil wars. This created an opportunity for architectural experimentation. Imagine if Washington, D.C. were destroyed, natural disaster or otherwise we would suddenly put a lot of resources into rebuilding it, and artists would be drawn to it. So you can imagine what's happening here in Japan. It's going to be something very similar. One of the major architects of uh, rebuilding Nara is going to be Shogun. And he studies contemporary Chinese architecture uh, as he rebuilds some of these temples and shrines. And the piece we're looking at is actually an image of him. So this is an example of high naturalism prevalent in the period. Now, we're in the 13th century. In Europe, we're building Gothic cathedrals. Images of people are starting to just look like people. Just starting. Michelangelo isn't for another 200 years. And yet in Japan, we have this incredibly naturalistic sculpture life-size sculpture that, when it was freshly painted, would have been like looking at the man himself. This is a wood sculpture. And to give you an idea, those beads that he's holding, the meditation beads, that's not beads on a string. Those are carved in place. That's a solid piece of wood. It's really quite remarkable. And the piece is then... Once it's carved out of wood, covered in gesso, that very thin plaster we've dealt with in the past, and then painted to look as lifelike as possible. And this shows the skill of these sculptors at the time. And what they're doing is they're actually studying sculpture from the Song Chinese, this being one example, which are starting to become incredibly lifelike. They're not idealized like we see in the Renaissance, but they're definitely far more lifelike than anything we're seeing in Europe in the 12th or 13th centuries. And they're focusing on natural form and detail. Even the eyes are remarkable because the eyes here, 
They've captured a certain element of asymmetry, which is key to understanding anyone's likeness because we aren't all symmetrical. And they use rock crystal for eyes. Uh, so these eyes would look like glass eyes today where you have maybe quartz used for the white of the eye and then different stones used for the pupil and the iris and it would be remarkably lifelike. You can imagine maybe bumping into this thing at night and being terrified of the fact that this might be an actual person. By the way, he's wearing a uh, Buddhist monk's robe and that's not uncommon at the time. Uh, there isn't really a set form for monk's robes, especially in Japan. So with him sitting down at meditation, because of what he's doing at the time, it makes sense that he's wearing those clothes. 